Today we're continuing to talk about violating Hardy-Weinberg assumptions. Uh, so last time we were talking largely about genetic drift. Today we're going to talk about some other types of uh, violations of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Gene flow is a very important one to understand. And gene flow is actually really interesting because uh, it's almost always violated. <laughs> gene flow and non-random mating are probably the two easiest to violate assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And what gene flow is, is just organisms moving from one population to another one. But what that does is that introduces new alleles, or if someone's leaving a population, it removes old alleles from the population. And like we talked about with genetic drift, small population size makes this makes populations much more susceptible to it and makes it much easier for new alleles to get introduced. So gene flow between large populations isn't necessarily the biggest of things, but it is there. Like human populations, as much as we like to think that we are all disconnected, we live in our own parts of the world and don't interact, we do. They're through international trade, through corporations, through travel, those are interactions. And what inevitably happens when there are interactions is that populations interact and they mingle. And mingling makes babies. Um, and that can happen more easily than some people think. There's a lot of people who have uh, formed relationships and families through international travel and who might be from two very different parts of the world but meet and end up uh, mixing their gene pools. And that's normal. In fact, most populations of most species have gene flow between them. It, humans are certainly the best at evading gene flow barriers, but they're very much not the only one. And that exchange of genetic material helps to keep the species cohesive. And actually, gene flow is one of the most important things to break in a speciation event. Uh, if you think about allopatric speciation from last year, where you have a physical barrier separating two populations and then they become two species over time, that is broken gene flow right there. But it also happens in sympatric speciation where two populations just start to have different patterns and over time those different patterns or feeding habits or night cycles means that they diverge from one another. So in both of those cases gene flow has been broken because our definition of species is stuff that can't interbreed. Well, the only way that you get it so there's enough genetic distinction between two populations to prevent them from breeding is don't let them breed for a long time. So you have to break gene flow for speciation. Uh, mutation is also a very easy one to violate because mutation just happens. So again, large populations will be insulated against this. It's not a big deal in a big population, one mutation in a gene pool of hundreds of thousands is not going to make much of an impact. But in a gene pool of a couple dozen, it does. So what mutation does is it introduces new variation. And that is actually a great thing because that's what allows natural selection to work. But this can change allele frequencies and does have a big impact, even in large populations, when it works in conjunction with natural selection and or non-random mating. And not incoincidentally, those are our last two violations of Hardy-Weinberg. Um, <laughs> mating's not random. It, it isn't. Indivi just based off of geography, first off, even though I said that everything is interconnected and all populations do have gene flow between each other, especially with humans. The simple fact is that you are more likely to end up uh, reproducing with someone who is nearby. Because unless you are a tree that can pollinate over the wind, 
physical proximity matters. And even then, even for species that just release their gametes into the air or the ocean, physical proximity matters. The closer two individuals are to each other, the more likely they'll be able to reproduce. And then with animals, it's a prerequisite. Physical contact is necessary. So it's that automatically means that it's less... The, that takes out randomization in the population. Even if you're just talking about a city, you are more likely to reproduce with an individual who shares the physical locations that you attend to. Someone that you meet at a bar that you like. Uh, someone who goes to the same school or works at the same workplace. Just because there's that greater likelihood for interaction. And the greater the likelihood for interaction, the greater the likelihood for babies. Um, not letting go of the sex thing anytime soon, sexual reproduction literally means that for most populations, if you are sexually reproducing, you cannot mate with the other 50% of the population. There are exceptions. We've talked about plenty of those throughout the course of the year. Um, slugs don't have this problem because they have both male and female reproductive organs. Mammals do. So mammal populations are never non-random mating because just by having testes or ovaries, that cuts out who you can reproduce with. So it's possible that they will violate Hardy-Weinberg assumptions just based off of that. Um, sexual selection as well is a big thing. Uh, Organisms tend to have strategies for selecting mates, and while sometimes these end up with ridiculous things like peacocks, a peacock's ridiculous tail it can be a good barometer for how healthy the male bird is. So, uh, species that sexually reproduce use sexual selection in order to pick their mates. They pick their mates. If you're picking your mate, it's not random. The individuals who are sexually um, preferred, they will get to contribute their genes to the next population more frequently than those who aren't. And even in species that are supposedly monogamous, and we will acknowledge right now that we know from humans that monogamy is not always something that we are great at, and many species of organisms that Victorian dudes thought were monogamous, especially birds, are not. But even in species that mate for life and tend to stick with one reproductive partner, even then, there are individuals who don't get to reproduce, which is slightly different than individuals who choose not to reproduce, which is a valid choice for humans. Um, but there are individuals who don't. And those individuals who don't got sexually selected against, possibly. And that means that the people who do have a mate do get to reproduce and contribute their genetic material to the next generation. Finally, we have natural selection. And natural selection is based off of fitness. And fitness, we have to remember, in population genetics doesn't mean how buff, it doesn't mean how smart, it means how good you are at reproducing. So how often and how successfully you reproduce and how often those individual offspring make it to their own reproductive stage is what fitness means in genetic and evolutionary uh, terms. So over time, certain uh, phenotypes will be more successful than others. That means they get to pass on their genes more often, they get to contribute to the gene pool more often, and they are more likely to pass on both the gene and the genotype. And of course, since genotype determines phenotype, that means the phenotype gets passed on more often as well. So a fitter individual is more likely to reproduce simply based off of survival, and they're more likely to pass on their genes.